Welcome back, everybody. This is uh, Silicon Angle and Wikibon's The Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angle. I'm joined by my co-host, Dave Vellante, co-founder of Wikibon.org. And now uh, we're joined here with Patrick Osborne, director of product management and marketing at HP Storage. Welcome back to The Cube. Uh, great to see you again. Great to see you I guys. I think the last time the three of us were together, we were getting our hearts ripped out, was the Bruins lost in overtime. Right? Oh, <laughs> yeah, a lot of, lot of banter with the Chicago Blackhawks fans yeah, there that, in the Boston. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Las time. Vegas uh, was an event there, kick ass. Um, so, uh, Patrick, so you've been the man about town here in Barcelona, you know, you know reading the, the police blotter. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, yes. No, it was great. Great dinners to see you. Obviously, you had a great storage party. You know, well known. You know, obviously, three par, yep. the shining star example of one of the best group within HP, performance wise, product wise, team wise. Have a great party. Saw you that night, and then you gave the unveiling product. We broadcasted that live on Silicon Angle here, uh, the Cube. So, what's it like, man? You're in the front center stage again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a privilege to bookend the uh, you know the cube experience here at Discover. So it's uh, it's been fantastic. We've got a lot of great reception from our customers, from our partners, and uh, we're coming out with some hot products in the area of backup, recovery, and archiving. Uh, obviously, saw a lot of momentum this past year with three par, you know, over a billion dollars run rate, and we're going to augment that with. Store once and store all, and some of the solutions we're bringing to the market to help our customers solve their backup problems. So let's talk about the marketplace. So what's, give us uh, your take on it. You have to look at the product management. Let's talk about the marketplace. What's mm -hmm. going on in the market right now in storage? Obviously, you, got, you have conflicting approaches, conflicting products. You have competition. Yep. Share with us your view of the current landscape in the market. What's happening in the storage market? Yeah, so uh, in the storage market, a lot of things are hot. You know, like you guys are you know, right in it with big data and flash is a, is a huge area. One of the things that we see as a sort of a, a long tail trend is our customers have not invested in backup and recovery architecture for three to five years. And you saw some of the stats that David and Craig talked about, about over the last two years, we've created a huge onslaught of information in the data center, at the edge, in the cloud. So for mis, uh, risk mitigation purposes, we need to provide our customers with an architecture that's going to scale and help them solve some of these backup problems because they are literally dying, they're underwater. Um, so from uh, for our perspective, we are putting a lot of R&D in this space, not only for the product side, but also in significantly investing in uh, services and go to market, which is you know, the other half of the equation this, in this area. So talk a little bit more about, about the state of backup um, why it's so challenging. I've mm -hmm. often said backup is, is, is a little bit broken. Yeah. Um, why is that, in your view, or do you agree, and, and what's the fix? So, backup you know, fundamentally hasn't changed a lot in the last 20, 25 years. Um, and because of that, customers are they're definitely underwater. So, the challenges that we see are not only making and completing the SLAs for their data protection, and at risk because of all this volume of data, and the other piece of it is um, the, the, the always on IT enterprise has definitely shrunk those requirements around RTO and RPO. And fundamentally that whole target based, I have an agent, I back it up to tape, isn't going to cut it anymore. So you need to be able to blend all those modern data protection techniques like snapshot and replicate with this rich target based backup and then ultimately have you know, a tier of storage out there in tape that's really, really cost effective because people have to keep this data for seven, 15, sometimes 40, 50 years for regulation uh, purposes. So tape is not dead? Tape is absolutely not dead, and we have sales figures and, and market share figures to, to prove that. So. so you mentioned snapshots before, because one yeah. of the things that we've talked about in Wikibon for, for quite some time is this, this notion of taking space efficient snapshots over you know, mm -hmm. some period of time, um, you know, depending on your, your RPO you know, appetite. Uh, and then actually doing recovery from, from disk, obviously that's something that you guys are, yep. are espousing as well. But there's also sort of a software component here for the recovery. Now, 
Um, some of the some you got some of the pieces, but you know, data data protector obviously mm -hmm. is part of your organization or part of HP, not part of the storage organization. But and, and George Kadifa was up talking about backup. So I'm curious as to how your groups are sort of working together to solve this problem and attack this new opportunity. Yeah, so we work very closely with the uh, HP information management folks. Um, we've got some really fundamental uh, integration with um, software packages like Data, uh, data Protector and Autonomy, uh, idle at the end of the day. So what we provide is uh, an experience that's going to allow the customer to manage their primary uh, snapshots, right? So if you need that really, really low RPO, RTO requirement in you know, minutes where you need to restore a VM in a couple minutes, you need to restore a really granular object, you can have that coordinated by Data Protector on 3PAR, for example, right? You can use all that rich policy management and backup schedule you would get in Data Protector and extend that to you know, primary data center snapshots. Now, do you want to keep all that backup data on 3PAR at that price for a really long time? Probably not. So what we allow you to do is federate that with store once. You got a near line disk based um, backup system that's very high performant. And then at the end of the day, after some people you know, call it a month, some people do it after six months, 12 months, send that to a really long-term data retention on tape. Um, and that whole ecosystem is managed together with the software and we work, work with those guys really closely. So you guys made a couple announcements this week. Uh, you did a, you did a uh, store once refresh, top to bottom, store yep. all, which is your product. Also a, a refresh, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so um, at the end of the day, we have this uh, polymorphic, simplistic yeah, architecture. we talked to uh, David Scott about that, John. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he invented the term, polymorphic, it's in Wikipedia. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, we, we actually, it's, it's a reality for us, especially from an engineering standpoint. So at the end of the day, store once and store all are using all the same hardware and software components to deliver two different solutions, one in a backup and recovery scenario and the other in an archiving scenario. There's a little bit of difference in some of the protocols and the data services, but what it allows us to do is, um, is focus our R&D on the software and the features that our customers want. And it also allows the customers to, if they invest in this platform, they not only get a bunch of different uh, personalities, and then they're allowed to uh, only learn one CLI, one GUI. So from a management standpoint, it gets very inexpensive you know, from them to consolidate onto this type of solution. As Patrick, as people move toward, I want to come back to sort of back up a little bit. As people move toward this IT as a service, um, do you see backup being able to be delivered as one of those services? Very granular fashion, mm -hmm. you know, by application, sort of first question. And then second question is, the data has always been sort of cordoned off. Okay, that's yep. the backup data. Yeah. Do you see it being able to be utilized in other systems? Archive, you know, store all, you know, data warehouses, et cetera. I wonder if you could talk about those two trends. Yeah, so uh, we have a lot, of, um, a lot of partners, especially, uh, I'd say I'd put them in that tier two service provider space, where they've graduated from maybe being a value-added reseller, where they sell you know, customer vertically-oriented application hardware stack. Now they want to provide them some, uh, an off-premise data center hosting capability, right? So you have your primary app and your data that sits inside your data center, and they say, hey, Listen, as a part of that, I want to provide you DR, so I'll provide you compute in my data center, and I'm going to provide you backup. And so what we've seen is a lot of service providers come to us utilizing StoreOnce, uh, StoreOnce VSA in particular, so we can take that, um, that bare metal StoreOnce appliance that sits at the customer site, back up to it as a service uh, with the store once VSA, because most of the service providers are using a very heavily um, virtualized environment to cut down on costs. And you've got uh, a service that customers are, you know, they're buying on a daily basis. We have customers uh, and partners here in Europe that are spinning up this backup as a service, this BAS type of uh, concept mm -hmm. on a weekly basis. It's, yes. uh, it's pretty good. So you got the pressure from the, uh, the cloud guys, you know, kind of yep. Amazon comes out and everybody wants to be like Amazon, and, and then people write books and say, oh, it's all going to the cloud. Mm -hmm. and that doesn't happen. I mean, it's happening in certain segments, but the whole thing's not going to the cloud. So what you have is the pressure on IT to be more cloud-like. Yep. So you're seeing that trend. So you've been in the industry for a while, you've got a good technical acumen, you talk to a lot of customers. What are you seeing in terms of their ability from an infrastructure standpoint to close that gap with the cloud service providers? And how is HP supporting that? Yeah, so we see, so 
in addition to that backup as a service that those you know, service providers are, 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 are delivering, we have customers that are using that very template to deliver that same kind of service within their, you know, within their four wall data center. Um, what we also see is customers a little bit more willing to put um, new applications up in the cloud. Um, what we don't see them willing to do is um, put their backup data in their, some of their core data up in the cloud because of regulatory uh, issues right now. So that we want to be able to provide them a service where they can have a hybrid deployment and have data on site in the data center and on tape uh, because in a lot of these cases, especially in Europe, you, you have data sovereignty laws. So if you can't physically point to where that data sits and you know, sits for a long period of time. So we have that and then we partner with HPES so our enterprise services division will allow you to do managed hosted environments. They'll do complete you know, public and, uh, and hybrid uh, private cloud deployments. So we see almost 30 or 40% of our business going through HPES at this point and doing that type of managed hosted uh, really? backup. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge growth vector for us. Yeah, it's interesting what you said about the geolocation of the data. And yep. Germany is one place that's very strict about where the data resides. And I've had this discussion with Amazon at reInvent. We talked, John and I talked to folks at Amazon about it. What they said was, First of all, they said, we can determine where it goes. I said, well, but what about Germany? You don't have a data center in Germany. They said, well, we use, we use Ireland. It's mm. part of the EU, so we're good there. And I asked, has that ever been tested in a court of law? They said, well, not to our knowledge, but so interesting dynamics there. There's a lot of uncertainty. Some customers just say, no, I'm not going right. to risk that uncertainty. Others say, ah, well, I'll, I'll roll the dice. HP uh. has a lot of core customers that are in financial services, they are in government here, you know, a country yeah. government, local government, and um, at the end of the day, we have our sort of storage leadership councils, and we talk to those type of customers, and they are they are not signing up for that right now. You're tuned into the trends in, in Europe. You used to live here, right? We we're talking off camera. You used to live in, in Spain. The whole Snowden thing. How has that affected customers' perception about data and privacy? Yeah, it's uh, we we had the uh, the booth unveiling on Monday, and we had a number of press events, you know, after that. And every interview was uh, NSA, Prism, security, encryption, and you know, from for a these person, are European journalists. Yeah, right? and it's from, from a person that's designing <laughs> hammering the Americans data center <laughs> infrastructure for storage. You know, it's a, it's a new line of questioning that you know is. Um, it's, it's very topical right now. It's not something that usually, from an infrastructure standpoint, you're getting that, right? Um, so we are, you know, we do a lot of work with not only providing uh, encryption capabilities on all of our products. So 3PAR, we've got self-encrypting drives. Tape has, you know, our store over tape line has always had encryption and we do all, you know, sorts of key management to enable that for customers. We just released uh, encryption on the store once line. So that's a big issue, and, I, and, I, and it's been coming up, it's more popular customers, so I'm gonna, I see that as um, getting enabled not only for sort of this data at rest, you know, to sort of mitigate against theft and that kind of risk, um, but actually just being able to do it from a, a secure erasure standpoint and privacy. So, I'm curious as to the line of question, because essentially what, you know, mm -hmm. what we've been hearing in our community is, wow, we, we kinda, kinda knew it, but the whole PRISM and NSA thing sh shown a new light on it, it being the fact that if the government says, Amazon, Google, Facebook, whomever, give us your data, they, they have to. Yep. They, okay, we want this segment of the data. It's already happened. Turn it over, Workday, yeah. Salesforce, boom. Now, if you have your own data center, mm -hmm. right, and the government comes in and says, do that, you know, th there's ways in which you can say, well, no. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not going to do that. Absolutely. So that's, that trend is really uh, a tailwind for you guys, isn't it? Yeah, it is, and um, you know, at the end of the day, we want to provide customers with choice. Um, a choice to, if they want to implement these type of services with security, we've got great things, you know, you've seen with ArcSight, I'm sure you've talked to those guys, yeah. in terms of the you know, fabulous sort of endpoint and security features that, that they're providing. We want to provide that same level of infrastructure security that you'd have you know, in this enterprise type. Because at the end of the day, as we move along this curve for software-defined data centers, we have all of our architectures, our modern x86, Linux kernel based, and we're going to extend those into VSAs you know, our, across our product line. So that type of storage service is going to get spun up in the data center, it's going to get spun up in a hosted management private, it could be you know, getting stood up in public clouds, and you want to be able to give people the choice for 
endpoint security, for data in flight security, as well as encryption, you know, for the data at rest, because in, at the end of the day, that's, those are all multi-tenant environments. They're going across public lands, and you never know. I want to ask you about Express Query, this capability that came out yeah. of HP Labs. I, I got really excited about it, because it came out simultaneous with the whole theme of real-time big data, mm. and that's not how you guys have positioned it, I understand it, but maybe you could describe what Express Query is. Give us an update on sure. the capability and how it's being used. Yeah, so Express Query is um, fundamentally helping us uh, solve problems at scale for unstructured data. So we have a lot of customers that are, maybe they're doing some kind of a big data type of analytics, you know, using some of the solutions we have for, you know, uh, for Vertica and some of our Hadoop reference configurations. At the end of the day, we have a lot of customers who are just storing a lot of unstructured data. So whether that be you know, content for a content delivery network, they have media asset management. I mean, you've seen some of the folks come through here, all digital, DreamWorks, and you know, those kind of folks. They are moving from hundreds of millions of files to billions of files and beyond. And at the end of the day, being able to do the metadata management for that, being able to tag and be able to search and provide rich services around the ecosystem and the life cycle of that datum, you need to have database kind of constructs to go with, a, with, with your unstructured data. So what we've done is take an express query, which is a, a NoSQL type of implementation. It's our own database that we do. It's a very scalable metadata database that scales with store all, petabytes, billions of files, and it allows customers to you know, do simple t techniques of storage resource management, but at scale, you know, at that petascale, which is, is a big problem for traditional scale-up file servers. And it also, you know, a lot, we have a whole bunch of new features and functionality we announced in terms of um, new visual, visualization, uh, these very complex uh, multi-attribute queries. We've got data forensics, you know, so when you talk about security, who touched the file, where'd the file go, who deleted the file. Um, so you get some really rich um, data retention features, you know, in that, in that framework. And we're going to continue to do that and probably extend that to primary storage eventually. So how's it work? This thing comes out of HP Labs. Yeah. It's a technology. Right, yes, basically, and so you can, you can do a lot of things with it. You could build apps on top of it, you yep. can apply it to solve the problem that you were just describing. How does that work? Does it, does it sit inside of one group in HP? I mean, obviously you guys are picking yeah. it up. Can others pick it up? Absolutely, it and we have, um, we have a long pipeline of innovation that we work on with HP Labs. So we come to them and say, hey guys, I have this big hairy problem. You know, you guys are super smart, you need to go chew on that for six months for a year, you know? And they're really good at doing research, uh, prototyping, and so we work with them on some of these bigger challenges. You know, you see the, the Memristor work that's going on there, all, all this new advanced um, um, software technology that you know, we're working on the web. So we work with them, and their goal on innovating, but also making that innovation applied. So they, they, they have distinct goals on applying that their research to products that eventually make it out into the marketplace. So I know that, that uh, Express Query, the, our internal code name for that is Metabox, and there's other groups within HP that need to have a very thin, scalable type of NoSQL database for other types of software, and they absolutely reuse that, that IP in other places. Yeah, so we're, I'm excited to see how that gets applied. Yeah. So, uh, so let's see, a month and a half ago, we, uh, we knocked down another World Series championship in Boston. That title was town. Yeah, title <laughs> title town. town. Usually when that happens, yeah, the St. <laughs> Louis guy over there is bumming out. Sorry, I told you it was going to happen. <laughs> Usually when that happens, other good things tend to happen to, to teams in time out. Yep. I know with Gronk out, I'm not too... Uh, yeah, I'm not feeling that not one. That, 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 that was yeah. tough. That was tough. Drew, I was wandering the streets of uh, Charles Street in Boston. hit the Beacon Hill Pub. <laughs> That's right. You, uh, you were there. We came up. We flew in that we day. Came from I've never NYC. been to Beacon Hill Remember the big day at NYC event? Right, and we were in, yeah. uh, in Boston just kind of before I head to California. And technically, I, the curse of me leaving Boston, I left Boston in 99 and moved to Palo Alto. Since then, Red Sox won. Multiple world championships, Patriots win Super Bowls. Well, my family said, <laughs> don't come back. And Jason, but I landed wheels down after he hits the three run double, Shane Victorino. So technically, they were already up. The flying so, Hawaiian. So I didn't get, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I did not break the curse. So. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a great time to be in Boston. You yeah. got you got to be there. You got to live there to kind of to understand that whole situation. And right? the Bruins are looking good. You know, yeah, they're, they're, they're looking real fantastic. Right? We and got a couple uh, guys in my town. We got 
Tukarask and Sean Thornton live down the street oh, from really? us. And yeah, we, they're, they're, they're Charlestown, they're townies. Tuka's so, looking great. Yeah. You know, uh, I hope the Celts just tank it and go for the draft picks. <laughs> I, I don't know. They take on that. I, I mean, you know, I don't think they're going to they're gonna mail it in. I think they're going to put a good, a good solid year in. When Rondo uh, comes back. When Rondo yeah. comes back, they have some. Their coach is fantastic, and I yeah, think there's only good things that are going to happen for those guys. But, you know, like you said in, in, in the preamble about the team, uh, you know, Red Sox, it's all about team chemistry, and you, you definitely see that in our leadership team for storage. It's a definitely a, a solid crew, and we come out with great products, and at the end of the day, it's about the people that deliver them to our customers. So well, you guys are certainly doing a great job. I mean, the storage team, uh, Dave and I were talking about, um, of all HP, the storage team is, is leading the charge at many levels, business performance, product excellence, Great team. After parties. After parties. Yeah. Just <laughs> over around, great. The new HP, the new style of IT, the new style of storage. Yeah, uh, exactly. Congratulations. Patrick, thanks for coming inside the Cube. Great to see you. Uh, this is the Cube. We're live, day three, getting ready to wrap up. The next segment is our day three wrap up, show wrap up with Dave Vellante. I'm John Furrier, this is the Cube. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break.